This is the world's first autonomous, intelligent weed burner. It uses machine learning to identify weeds, then moves this giant lens over the weeds and focuses the power of the sun to burn the weeds to death. I use it to take care of weeds in my garden here, but it could be used in a lawn or field as well. The brain of this is a Raspberry Pi computer. The eyes are a Raspberry Pi camera pasted to the bottom side of this assembly, which get images of the ground directly below the lens. The brain is running a customized image classification model in TensorFlow, and when it sees a weed, it uses this motor and this motor to manipulate this big lens over the weed. Then it uses these three motors to focus the beam of light on that weed, and finally, lifts the lid to paint the weed in burning sunlight. After clearing an area, it uses the wheels to move forward to the next area. The robot relies on a Fresnel lens. You can think of this thing as a giant magnifying glass. It was originally used to take light from a lighthouse and then focus it into a straight out beam of light rather than letting it spread in all directions. We're using it in reverse. Incoming sunlight is focused down to a point about two feet below the lens. There are concentric ridges in circles all around this thing, and if you imagine a magnifying glass of this size, the shape and angle of the magnifying glass at any point along there has been taken straight down and made into a ridge. And in that way, all the light that is incident on this thing is focused down to a point right down here. Some limitations should jump out when you're looking at this setup. First off, this thing has to be pointed directly at the sun. If we change the orientation of the lens, you don't get a focused beam of light. Second, it has to be the right distance off the ground. If you're too high up or too far down, you're not going to get a focused beam of light. Only when it's at the right height will you get focused to a point. Also, the sun has to be in the sky. Uh, even today is fairly cloudy and you're not going to get really hot focusing off of this, even though it probably will work. Also, you want the sun to be high in the sky, say between 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. Otherwise, uh, it's too low in the, on the horizon to do much. Now, when you get all of those things just right, you can burn a weed like this. But of course, while you're moving this thing around, you don't want to be accidentally burning weeds as you're moving it around looking for your next victim. So of course, you want to cover this with some kind of a lens cover. But now, you don't really know if you're oriented toward the sun. So what I discovered was, it's a lot smarter to have cutouts on your lens cover, and now, on the ground, you can actually see four points of light. You can center them over your weed, you can bring this up, 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 up until that's focused into a single point. And now, when you remove that lens cover, you'll actually start that weed up in smoke, like so. When the robot powers on, it runs a Python program whose only job is to find and destroy weeds. The first thing that it does is it uses this thing right here, which I call a sun tracker, to get generally oriented towards the sun. Inside each of these quadrants is a photoresistor, and it uses whether or not it's in the sun or not to decide if this thing is pointed toward the sun. After that, it goes into a fine adjust mode where it uses the camera on the bottom of this assembly right here and the light that passes through our, our lid right here to find the projection of the sun onto the ground and then center that in the middle of the image. That way we know that this lens is directly oriented towards the sun. Once oriented towards the sun, the camera on the bottom side here takes an image of the ground. It then breaks that image into three by three inch squares and it analyzes each square to decide if there's a weed in that square. I tried using other TensorFlow plant identification models like iNaturalist, but their strength is not identifying weeds taken uh, two feet above the weed when they're in a uh, baby phase. They just really struggled with that. So what I did instead was I took a Raspberry Pi camera around my garden. I took photos two feet off the ground. I broke those photos into three by three inch squares, and then I classified them into weed or plant. And I retrained the MobileNet TensorFlow model so that I had a customized image classification model that works for the weeds and plants in my garden, and it works surprisingly well. I'll teach you how to do that a bit later in the video. Once a weed is found in one of those three inch by three inch squares, the motors here and here are used to swing the lens to the right place and then move it in or out so that it's over that weed. Then we reorient towards the sun using the same methods I discussed before. And lastly, we use this linear actuator here to move the entire assembly up. That focuses the beam of light from four separate beams of light on the ground to a single beam of light passing through here. Once we've reached that stage and we're centered over the weed, it's time to lift the lid. That brings the full force of the sun down on that weed and we actually move this entire assembly around in that three by three by three inch cube. We go up and down as well so that we can burn weeds that are even a bit off the ground. That way we sure we paint that entire area with cleansing, burning sunlight and get rid of any weeds in that square. 
Last, the same linear actuator lowers back towards the ground, which unfocuses this lens. That way we don't accidentally uh, burn something in the garden, even with these targeting arrays here that are focused into a single beam. We keep them in four separate beams and that avoids any accidental burnings. As a gardener, seeing weeds go up in smoke is incredibly satisfying. And as a father of two little kids, saving time weeding is really, really useful. In this video, I'm gonna show you how I built this, how I built the model for the image classification, and how to get this running yourself. Two important notes before we go into the build details. First off, this thing starts fires. So, never operate this robot when it's above something that could start a fire. That means leaves, mulch, dry grass, etc. And because the robot moves forward, don't ever run this when there are flammable materials ahead of it. Now this sort of ground is ideal. You can see it's dirt, it's relatively wet, just a few things interspersed in there, and it not, it's not gonna start any fires. Um, you should still work somewhere nearby so that you can keep an eye on this thing while it's operating. Number two, you may look at this and say, really? It looks like, honey, I shrunk the kids. You want me to build that? To which I say, yeah, I get it. It's a prototype and it needs to be improved, but it works. And I've never seen this idea before. Also, the idea has potential to improve organic gardening and agriculture, which means cheaper, better food for more people. So if you want to build this as is, go for it. It'll need help sometimes, but it works. If you think this should be improved, again, go for it. I actually am going to discuss five improvements for the next revision of this at the end of the video. My real goal here is to move this from my head to the real world as quickly as possible so that it can do some good for people. Opening up to everyone now that the concept is proven so anyone can run with it is the fastest way to do that. Let's detail the build in four parts shown here. See the description below for links to resources for all of these. There you'll find the parts with prices and links to each part, the electrical schematic for wiring connections, and the Python code that runs on the Raspberry Pi to retrain your mobile net image classification model. First we'll build the lens control arm. Cut some lightweight wood. I used balsa wood and jumbo paint stirrers for this part. You can see it's 20 inch paint stirrers and 10 inch long balsa wood. Uh, you want to cut them to these sizes shown here and then grab some wood glue. Wood glue as shown and put it into a triangular shape that you see here. You want to let the bottom side dry before you start working on the top side. Set the lens on so that you can make sure that it'll sit in there comfortably. Here it is all glued together. Next, you're going to work on the cover for the lens. This is just a circle of cardboard. My kids drew on it for me. Stick some more balsa wood onto that. Then, mount your servo onto that triangle of balsa wood that you had and cut a small hole so that the servo arm can reach into there and spin uh, freely. Use any screws that you can to stick that balsa wood lid cover onto that servo motor and make sure that it opens and closes naturally. Next, you're going to take one of those servo motors uh, mounting brackets and stick it onto the side of that jumbo paint stirrer. Then you're going to need to build some mounting brackets for your servo motors. These are just 2x4s that I cut into the right shapes so that they can hold a servo motor. Now screw all these servos and mounting brackets together as shown. And while we're here, let's set some terminology. These are the names for the servo motors in the code, so you should remember them here so you can match it up with what they're doing in the code. On the left is the lid servo that opens and closes the lid. On the right is the tilt servo that will tilt the entire lens assembly towards the peak of the frame or away from the frame. And then last is the roll servo, either right or left. I named it so that if you're facing the front of the frame and you see it roll to the right, uh, that is a right roll and a left roll. If you're antsy to see this thing work as I was, you can go ahead and connect this to a 5 volt power supply and then connect the signal pins of these servos to your Raspberry Pi and then using the motor control test script you can actually run these things like you see here. Next grab your 30 inch linear actuator and hold it up to the bottom of the roll servo mounting bracket. You're going to want to drill a hole into there that's the exact same size as that and then run a screw through the side of that mounting bracket through the little hole in your linear actuator end. It's going to look like this when it's all mounted. Connect the 20 kilogram servo arm to the end of the housing on the 30 inch linear actuator. Run short screws to avoid hitting the contact that's encased at the end of that metal housing, which I did unfortunately and had to replace. 
Next, you build a support structure under the 30-inch linear actuator. This is just a, a support for the linear actuator and the, and the uh, lens assembly. They're pretty heavy, and you don't want to put that weight on that little 20-kilogram servo motor and the screws holding it all together. So this wooden base supports that and still allows it to turn freely. Now screw the 20-kilogram servo into that support structure as seen here. And if we zoom out just a bit, this is what the whole setup looks like with the lens assembly put onto the end of that 30-inch linear actuator. Also, terminology is important. We call the 20-kilogram servo a swing servo and the 30-inch linear actuator the in-out linear actuator. Last step in the control arm and assembly, you need to put a 2x4 uh, across that wooden bracket that you made to hold up the 30-inch linear actuator, and then drill a hole and pin in, again, your uh, final linear actuator. This is called, creatively, the up-down linear actuator since it lifts the whole lens assembly up and down. And your control arm is now complete. On to part two of the build. Take some 2x2s and cut them into the links that you see here. You're going to have to bevel some of the edges to get them to fit tightly, but you'll figure that out as you start the assembly. Assemble those 2x2s two into the shape that you see here. It's just two A-frames on the side with supports going from the A-frames to the peak and across the A-frames. Next, you need to mount the control arm assembly hanging down from that A-frame, just hanging loose. Next, add wheels to the frame. As suggested earlier, a chain drive with larger motors is going to be a lot more reliable than these wheels. These are parts of just what I had laying around, so I used them. The rear wheels are bike rims, uh, they, and they have scrap metal that I used as a bracket to fix the wheel to the frame. Small motors that are low RPM and high torque uh, and have rubber wheels added to their axle drive those wheels, those bike rims. Um, the rubber wheels just sit in the rim and drive it forward. The front wheels are spare push mower wheels. Uh, a hole was drilled through the frame and the axle was then pinned in place. The important part when adding these wheels, whatever wheels you choose, is that the lens has to be two feet off the ground. Now it's time to build this thing which I've named a sun tracker. It's just a cardboard frame divided into four quadrants with a photoresistor mounted in each quadrant. The photoresistors can sense if they're in the sun or the shade, so in total this device is used for coarse adjustments of the lens assembly towards the sun. To build it, take uh, two pieces of cardboard and assemble them into the plus shape that you see here. Those are about four inches tall. Then take another square of cardboard and glue that to the bottom of your plus so that you have a cardboard base. Poke three holes through the base in each quadrant, a total of 12 holes. And then you push your photoresistor device, uh, the three pins at the bottom, the metal pins, through those holes that you've put in each quadrant, and then glue the photoresistor PCB to the cardboard so that it's mounted in place. Next, grab your soldering iron and a little bit of wire. You're going to solder together all of the powers, so four power pins together, and then four ground pins together, and then you're going to stub out a wire for the power in the ground, which will eventually be connected to your Raspberry Pi pins. Then take four more wires and solder those to the signal out pins of those photoresistors. Once you've done with that, you can uh, stick it all in place with some uh, electrical tape or uh, any sort of glue that you have. It's worth mentioning why this is needed. Um, when the robot first starts up, it sets the lens vertically. And originally I thought I would just take a photo of the ground, find the shadow of the lens, and then the bright spots of the targeting uh, array, and, and orient towards the sun using the tilt and roll motors. In fact, that's exactly what the fine adjust sequence does. Uh, as you see here in this image, it's found the outline of the shadow of the lens assembly, and those bright dots in the middle of the shadow are the light that passes through the holes in the lid of our, our lens. Um, and then it, it can then adjust the tilt and roll to center the targeting array uh, and make sure that we're perfectly oriented toward the sun. But if the sun is far from directly overhead, then when you look down, um, if you're pointed vertically, there is no shadow of the lens assembly and there's no bright spots to find. So it can't see anything and it doesn't know which direction to turn to get towards the sun. That's where the sun tracker comes in. It tells you roughly what direction the sun is regardless of where the sun is in the sky. Those little photoresistors put out a 1 or a 0 on their digital output depending on whether in the sun or the shade. And there's always one or two of those photoresistors in the sun and one or two of them in the shade, which tells you which direction to tilt and roll to expose the rest of the photoresistors to the sun regardless of where the sun is. The net is this thing gets you close to oriented towards the sun and then the camera that's looking down will see the lens shadow and the targeting array inside that and and it can do the fine adjust from there.
Now, fix the Raspberry Pi and Sun Tracker on the lens assembly that is the acute angle of the triangle of the lens assembly that you built. That's right next to the lid servo as shown in the picture. Then screw on the Cytron electronic speed controllers, those are ESCs, uh, to the wooden frame. I used sticky Velcro tape to stick the Raspberry Pi and Sun Tracker on so that I could remove them and move them as needed. Last, stick the Raspberry Pi camera on the bottom side of the lens assembly and angle it just a bit, as you see here, towards the lens. Um, you want it to be looking towards the center of the shadow of the lens rather than directly down. Uh, but don't worry about the angle getting it precise. You're actually going to adjust the centering in code later to match your build, um, so it doesn't have to be perfect here. Just angle it a little bit towards the lens. Now it's time to wire all this up and connect it to power. You can download this image shown here from the link in the description so you can look at it more closely. A couple things to note. First, attach the wires with some slack. The linear actuators move, the servos move, so you know wires are going to need to be able to expand and contract. Second, the power supply has two options in this, uh, in this picture. Um, they're in yellow boxes at the top. The first option on the left is, is battery power. So 12 volt comes out of the uh, LiPo battery, and then there's a buck converter that changes that to 5 volts. The big motors are all powered off of 12 volts, and then everything else is powered off of 5 volts. So all of the servo motors and the Raspberry Pi are powered off of the 5 volt. And that's for when you want to really operate this thing, um, you know, unattached. The second option shown on the top right is shore power. So 120 volt or 240 volt comes into a power supply, and that creates 12 volt and 5 volt supplies from there, and they're hooked up the same way. The nice thing about shore power is you can plug your monitor of your computer in and have it out, you know, sitting on top of this A-frame, and actually, uh, you know, connect it with HDMI to the Raspberry Pi and watch this thing run in real time, and so you can do debug and test. Next point, uh, the Raspberry Pi is on the left of the screen. The motors are all in the middle of the screen, and the sun tracker is in the bottom left. On the bottom right, there's a, just a diagram of the pinout of the Raspberry Pi. It's a little bit confusing. So what you want to look at is the, the pin numbers called GPIO 15 or GPIO 16, etc., etc. Don't look at the numbers that are in those little circles in the, in the center of that. But those are the numbers that you actually want to plug all this stuff into. Uh, the, the colors of the wires, if they are colored, um, that matches the color of the wire on that servo or motor, just to make it a little easier for you when you're hooking it up. Um, all the servos get power and ground from the 5 volt power supply, and uh, they get their signals from the Raspberry Pi GPIO pins. The sun tracker, on the other hand, those the, the little photoresistors, they get their power, ground, and signal all from the Raspberry Pi. That's 3.3 volt power, ground, and signal all from the Raspberry Pi. We're finally done with part two and on to part three, Raspberry Pi setup. So if you don't know what a Raspberry Pi is, it's, it's just a computer. It's about the size of a credit card. It's very inexpensive, very low on power usage, and you know it's good enough for what we're doing here. You're not gonna break any speed records, but for this, it's, it's great. I like the Raspberry Pi 02W shown here. You can see there's lots of options. It's very low power, very small, very fast. Um, but due to supply constraints, I got a Raspberry Pi 3, which is even slower. And you know what, it still works. Uh, you may need to buy some peripherals depending on which one of these you get. Uh, the most likely ones are a micro SD card. That's actually the hard drive for this thing, so you're going to put some an operating system on it and then put it into this thing. Um, second, uh, a mini HDMI cable to regular HDMI cable. So on one side there's a mini HDMI, and on the other side there's a regular HDMI. That's so you can plug it in and actually you know get your monitor going. Uh, maybe a USB hub, depending on which one you get. Uh, a micro SD on one side of it, and then like four normal USB plugs on the other. <clears throat> and that's so that you can, you know, plug it into the Raspberry Pi with the micro uh, USB, and then plug in your keyboard, mouse, and maybe a flash drive on regular uh, USB size. Um, for, for power on this, you can use an old phone charger uh, that has a micro uh, USB size on, on one side. Or you can just get any old supply that's 5 volt and ground and plug it onto the GPIO pins. That'll work too. So get your hands on this. Um, and then once it arrives, you can go to the Raspberry Pi website, download the Flasher program. This is uh, so that you can put an operating system on that SD card. So you'll plug in the SD card to your, your, your regular laptop. Um, you'll use the Flasher program to uh, flash the Raspberry Pi operating system. And the Raspberry Pi operating system is just Linux that's been made to work on Raspberry Pi. Uh, then take that SD card out of your regular old laptop and put it into the Raspberry Pi that you bought and turn it on. It'll take you through some initial setup uh, and you'll get a screen that looks like this. 
open up the terminal. This this little black box here uh, opens up a terminal. And if you're not familiar with that, it's a really powerful thing in Linux where you can type commands in and it'll do stuff for you. So you're going to run this set of commands. Uh, what this does is, uh, well, the first three commands there, um, anything where you see that little like uh, number sign, that's a, that's a comment. So the stuff below that is the actual command. So the first part just gets updates. You know, this is the first time it's been plugged in. Let's update everything, uh, you know, so it's the, the newest and best. Then the second part there, make sure that we have the right version of Python. Uh, at the moment, things are a little wonky. So you, you need to get 3.7.2 so that it will do all of the stuff that we need it to, but nothing newer than that because they haven't yet, yet built these functions for the newer versions of Python on Raspberry Pi, at least the Raspberry Pi 3. I think the Raspberry Pi 4 may actually be able to use a newer version of Python. We're going to intentionally downgrade Python to 3.7.2 using those instructions. Next, um, you, you want to make 3.7 the default Python so that when you run Python commands, it actually runs 3.7. And then uh, next, you're going to install pip. Pip is, um, think of it like a, a way to manage what goes in and out of Python, the packages that are available to Python. So you install pip, and then you run a bunch of pip commands right below that. And what it's doing is actually downloading uh, various dependencies or packages that we need Python to be able to use so that we can run our weed killer script. So there's things in there like the Pi camera. Well, we, we need to be able to turn on the camera, obviously. So that's you know the package that you would need for that. So um, don't do the very last command yet, uh, the last two commands there. There's a cron tab command and then a, a, um, every time on reboot, it's going to run that. What that actually is, is when you plug this thing in, um, that last command, the at reboot Python 3 command, is going to run the weed killer script. So in other words, every time you plug the battery into this thing, it just starts up and starts running the weed killer program. Uh, a cron tab is like a scheduler for a computer. You can have things run once a month, once a day, whatever you want. Um, so anyway, this runs every time it reboots. So this is how we make this thing into a single function computer. After we've done all this work and we will go through the actual weed killer script here in a minute and customize it for your build. Um, now you're ready and you want it to run every time. So when you turn this thing on, it starts going and that's how you do it. You're going to put it in the cron tab. It's time for the final section. This is part four where we customize all the code and get it up and running on your setup. So you're going to start out with this thing called motor control. Motor control is just a way to exercise all the motors on this thing. Uh, you see it's got the pin numbers assigned just like they are in the wiring diagram. And then it goes into this uh, setup process down here. So all, all of this section here is um, declaring things and getting it set up. The couple things to pay attention to. Your lid, tilt, roll and swing values. There are numbers in these. And depending on what, you know, how much you had rotated the motor when you actually built your thing, um, what's considered neutral for your robot, you know, the, the lens facing up is going to change. So, um, you know, the tilt may be four and a half or maybe five or maybe six. And that will, you know, when your tilt is six, that will have this thing pointing directly up. So what we're going to do with this script is first off, make sure all the motors work. And second off, um, find out what range we should have in here. So you want to experiment with these values right here, these four values until you get everything perfect. So the swing should be, uh, that means that the, the lens is in the center of the robot when it starts up, the roll and the tilt, make sure that this thing is facing up and the lid, make sure that the lid is closed. Then when you jump down just a little bit lower, this try loop right here, all it's doing is making a loop where we exercise every motor. Um, and so we start out right here. We set those same values for our uh, lid, tilt, roll, and swing. And then we wait three seconds. We write something out so that we know that we've gotten there. And then we change those values. Um, so, you, you know, you're going to want to go to, uh, I went from four and a half to six, from nine to 11, from eight to nine. Um, and then the same thing, we go back to our neutral values and then we go in the other direction. And the point of this is, Find out what numbers you can drop in there so that you swing completely from the right to the left, uh, so that you tilt completely forward and back, you know, whatever your robot build can handle. And you're going to take those values and drop them into the actual script where this runs so that it has a full range of motion. Otherwise, you know, your, your robot may not be able to fully swing and it'll never actually reach the weed that's over on the right side or the left side, et cetera, et cetera. 
Um, this part down here, this part called move actuator, is where we test out the linear actuators. So uh, this, you don't actually need to calibrate anything for it. It just shows that it works. So it moves the actuator up, it moves it down, uh, or sorry, in and out, and then up and down. And then these last two here are, are moving the wheels. So making sure that the wheels go forward when we run it. Um, just make th that helps you make sure that you've connected these things correctly. If you if you swapped wires, uh, it'll go down instead of up when you expected it. So run this thing, and you'll get a video that looks something like this. Okay, we're back, and now we're going to go on to step two. We've got a, a robot that can move, um, and now we need to make a model so that this thing can identify weeds. So the first thing to do is run this little script right here on your Raspberry Pi. This takes a photo every second. So you're going to want to take your, lithium, your LiPo battery, your 3S battery, put a buck converter on it so you've got 5 volts coming out, hook it up to your Raspberry Pi and make this thing run on reboot. So in the cron tab, you can do an at reboot and then this script right here. Um, it's important because you're going to actually wander around your garden, farm, whatever it is, and take a photo two feet off the ground with that same Raspberry Pi camera in the same configuration that it is when we're, when we're actually running this thing. Um, and you'll be able to get sample photos. So I did this and what it looks like is uh, this. These are the, the full pictures of me wandering around my farm. You can see my shadow in these pictures right here. And you actually do want your shadow in these because the shadow of the lens is going to be in these. That's part of the training set. But I got a whole, whole, whole bunch of photos here uh, going around the farm. And these are big photos. Uh, they're you know, 1,000 by 1,500 um, uh, pixels. So you get all of those and you put them on a, a pretty powerful computer. Don't put these on your Raspberry Pi because um, we're actually going to build the model in the next step. Raspberry Pis don't have enough juice to build models. You're going to have to do that on a Windows or Linux or app, you know, Apple Macintosh uh, uh, laptop. So you get all of these photos, right? And then you're going to pop back to this next uh, script right here. It's called Divide Image and sort win. And by the way, all of these Python scripts that I'm showing you here are available in the description. They are linked in the description, so you can download these and run them yourself. Now this one you're going to have to customize a little bit. You see I've got paths that are specific to my laptop here. Um, you're going to change those paths so they are specific to your laptop. But what this does is it's a really simple way to take those photos, the 1000 by 1500 pixel photos that you just had, and divide them down into 224 by 224 uh, snapshots, you know, little, little tiny photos, and then classify them. So the key to this is what what it's actually doing here is it's it's you know getting all of the JPEGs that are out there in that directory. It says I'm going to work on this image, and then uh, it uses this for loop right here and this for loop right here to divide up the images. It, this is the step where it actually crops them down to a certain size, and it just makes windows. It steps through the thing, um, and then down here where it's got the um, CV2 M show right here. So it shows you what it is and then it waits for you to put in a key. And this is the important bit. Um, it'll show you the image. You look at it and you go, oh, that's a dandelion. That's a, a you know, grass. That's um, a potato plant or whatever it might be. And you type in the key that corresponds to that. I actually made up a little like wrote up a key so that I would, I would have something useful to look at. Um, let me show you what this looks like then. So what it does in the next step is whatever key you gave it, it drops it out into that directory. So if I go back here and I look at, um, wrong one. okay, in my training directory here. So I had all those farm training pictures there. Um, this right here, you can see there's a single letter that describes each of these folders. So if I go to P for potato, uh, it's going to be a whole bunch of 224 by 224 pixel uh, images of potato plants. And if you go back and you look up, um, I don't know, I think D was dirt maybe? Uh, yeah, so there's a whole bunch of dirt photos in here. Um, X, so let's see. M, what was M, I wonder? Oh, it looks like morning glory. Anyway, so the idea is you go through every one of those photos and that script will take you through every one of them you took and you're going to get like 24 uh, two, you know, snapshots out of each one of them and you're going to classify every one of those. 
Uh, these these folders right here aren't very useful names. So what I did was I actually copied that directory over to here and I put useful names on them. And I had some that I did, didn't know how to classify when I first went through it. So I, I then reclassified them here. I cleaned it up. So everything in this Clover directory is is Clover. Everything in the oats directory is oats. Everything in the potatoes directory is potatoes. So I, it, it's a, it was a really easy way to help me sort through all those little tiny snapshots. So now I've got all of these things right here, um, and this is what's considered a training set for your um, for your image classification model. So we're going to take the mobile net, uh, which is like a, a generic model that's just out there. It's a real fast, real small model, and we're going to retrain it using all of these directories that we just created right here. These are the commands that you can run on your Windows or uh, Linux laptop to get the right uh, the right stuff installed for Python so that it can do the model building. Um, we just ran this step, which is dividing it into 224 by 224 pixels and you know classifying it by hand. Um, then I found this to be really useful. I got it from this website right here. Uh, it's a little it's a little command line tool that you can use, um, and I use it to create the class labels file. Didn't know how to create that on my own, so it spits that out as part of it. It also spits out a model, but it doesn't have quantization info, um, and so I ended up just doing the quantization info, uh, adding it by hand in this script down here. So once you have your class labels file from this script, uh, then you can jump down here and run this one, and it'll run for many hours. Uh, and we actually spit out a bunch of different models, and you can figure out which one you like the best. So what that script actually looks like is right here. Um, you can see if we jump all the way to the top here, uh, we tell it first off we're going to use MobileNet. That 224 in the MobileNet uh, model title tells us that it's 224 pixels. Um, then there's a bunch of stuff to help it download the right model from the web. And we don't have to do anything with this uh, until we get down to here. You see there's a bunch of paths specific to my laptop. Make them specific to your laptop. Um, and what we do is <clears throat> we actually retrain the model based on our uh, the, the directory of all of the um, images that we just that we just classified. So we, we do have that those cropped images. Uh, let's see where do we put those? Right here, um, data dir. This data dir is full of all of the data that we just classified ourselves. So you do need to modify this so that it points to whatever directory you have that has all of your. Uh, folders full of 224 pixel images of classified stuff. Then down here at the bottom, um, it goes through, it makes a model, it saves it off, a full TensorFlow uh, model. We can't use that. We have to use TensorFlow Lite. So what we do is we convert that TensorFlow model into a TensorFlow Lite model. And then we, uh, th that's this converter step right here. And then uh, we have to add quantization info. If you try to run that thing that just got spit out there, it won't work. You have to add quantization info because um, we don't have, well, th that's just how our models are created. I won't go into the details. Um, so we, we have the code here that adds quantization info for that. And it also adds the class labels file that we just created in the previous step. So uh, you have to modify all these paths to be specific to you. And then you can run this thing and it's going to spit out, uh, I think it's six models total. Three of them are quantized, three are not quantized. And you can go through the three quantized ones and see which ones work best for you. Um, but that's what this is. This actually creates a customized model that will work for only the images that you have at your farm. So that's great. We are on to the last part here, which is actually using the weed killer script. Um, here is the weed killer script. It's about 500 lines long, and we're going to start from the bottom up. The bottom is actually where like all of the action happens, and then everything above it is functions that support these things right here. Um, so this loop right here, this try loop, is where everything really happens. Um, there's just a, a bit of preamble before that uh, of, you know, various functions. But here, when it turns on, the first thing it does is run the sun tracker function, which finds the sun coarsely. Then it orients to the sun. This is the fine adjust where we try to get everything just so, so that the, the lens is really pointed towards the sun. Then we save off those values. We say, okay, sun's in this place in the sky. We're going to save off the, the swing, roll, and, and tilt uh, motor values so that we have those things in the right place. Um, then we run this loop over and over. So this loop right here is where the meat and potatoes happens. Um, we take a picture. We go through that picture. We, we actually set up an, a search pattern through it so that we can look first in the middle. And if there is a, a weed in the middle, we'll just burn it right away. And then we make a, a circles around that middle point. Um, and so we, we create this search index. And then down here, we actually just work our way through that search index. So we window 224 pixel uh, uh, 
views as we as we work our way through that image and then we try to classify it so the actual um, classification step starts up here we say this right here called categorize image we just cropped out an image and then we send it that cropped image and we get back what uh, our tensorflow model thinks that is and we get a score back so how confident it is in that in that score and we say if it's a weed and it's a you know fairly high uh, confidence we are going to blast that thing so um first thing is if it's already if we're already centered over it so in other words if our um we'll get into this with the target for x and y are but if we're already centered on it then go ahead and and run you know kill it so this right here kill kill uh weed when we you know raise the lens this is a this is the actual step where it raises the lens and you know moves it around in a three by three by three cube and tries to kill that weed so if we're already on it, just run it. Otherwise, um, we have to move ourselves over it. So we, we make ourselves a note, hey, we found this thing. Um, then we try to move towards that thing. So um, this right here, this function called move to weed is where we actually move all of our motors so that we center the lens over where that weed should be. Uh, we reorient to the sun because you know things are going to be just a little bit off and we want this to be perfectly oriented uh, we take a photo before we before we zap it and then we do that same that same script it opens up the lid it moves it around in a three by three by three pattern and then it's done um, so then this down here says let's move on if if we're done basically so if we just blasted a weed uh, that means we moved somewhere, we opened the lid, and we blasted it. Let's move back to our neutral position. If we uh, tried to get close to that weed and kept failing, in other words, we couldn't find the image, uh, let's, let's go back to neutral and try again. Um, or if we have searched everything, if we, looked at, if we looked at what's below us and we've already blasted all the weeds, now we can move on. So this is like a, a, a reset function. Everything below here is getting us back to neutral. Um, we set our we set everything back to the neutral values and we set all of our counters back to zero and then we move forward so we actually turn the wheels on uh right right down here this move wheels is actually commented out at the moment but you can you can remove that it says, even says remove uh, and then it'll actually move forward to the next patch of ground and then it starts all over it does all of this again so let's go back, um, we'll work our way up through this now and just take a look at these various functions so that you have some idea of what they do. This kill, kill weed function right here, this is the one that gets called when we wanna actually kill something. So what it does is, first off, it, it moves things up. Um, it, it takes a hold of the linear actuator, the up-down linear actuator, and it moves it up for 10 seconds. And that should focus our four beams of light into one beam of light so that when we open the lid, it really does zap. We're, we're totally focused. And then all of this stuff down here is just wiggling around our motors so that they go through that 3x3x3 three by three by three cube. And then it lowers back down and closes the lid. So that's what that function does. We move up just a little bit higher. Uh, this one moves the wheels, pretty simple. Um, you know, turn the motors on for a second and then start start over this one here just takes a photo um, it spits back a whole bunch of information about the photo the name of it the image the height and width and all that kind of stuff um, if we keep scrolling up here this one is the move to weed function so when we see a weed but we're not centered over it we pass in the x and y coordinates of where we want to go to and this tries to calculate how to uh, move all of the motors so that they end up over that weed the next is uh, categorize an image. This is where the real magic happens and all the heavy lifting happens. Um, it's actually right in here. We, we, um, so we get this uh, right here. We're going to uh, get the tensor image right here and this create from array RGB. So what we do, actually I should, I should mention this. Um, the first thing we do is we take our image and we change it from blue, green, red to red, green, blue important step uh, cv2 i think later versions of it already do that so this step right here could actually be removed because it'll already be rgb when it opens um, we we resize it, it just in case it wasn't 224 224 i, I stuck that in um, and then down here we actually create the tensor and we categorize this step right here takes like uh, half a second to run um, because we're actually trying to classify what this image is and that's 
you're always going to have that um, slowness there. Uh, it's it's hard to classify images. The rest of this program runs in a blink of an eye compared to this line right here where we actually classify the image. Um, then down here we try to categorize what it is and I biased this thing towards noticing weeds. So if it thinks that it's maybe dirt and maybe weed, I biased it to say, yeah, that's probably a weed. That way it'll go out and try to kill whatever's there. You can unbias it in that direction if you want um, so that it takes less action, just wh whatever you like. Um, and then it passes all that information back. So what, is it, what does it think the weed is? Uh, or what, what does it think is in that, that particular image that we passed it? The next one up here is called the uh, orient to sun. This is probably the most complicated function of this whole thing. What this does is it takes a picture of what's directly below uh, the, the lens, and it's, it's looking for the shadow of the lens and then the bright spots inside the shadow. So it assumes we're coarsely adjusted to the sun already, and it does a lot of fancy work. Um, Pi Image Search was the website where I learned a lot about this stuff and was able to customize out of there. But what we do first off is... Um, we, we figure out what the high and low threshold values. We turn, it, we turn it black and white, and then we figure out how white is white and how black is black in this image. And we, we use that to calibrate where is the outline of the shadow and where are the bright spots that we're going to look for. So then um, we actually find the contours of the bright spots. This is a super cool function. <clears throat> and we, we find the contours of the shadow. So we did a couple uh, operations up above to try to find those, uh, to, try, to try to separate things out, you know, uh, black things if they're blacker than this and make it perfectly white if it's whiter than this. And then the reverse, uh, you know, so that we can find the shadow. So um, we... What we're doing in this section here is looking only for bright spots that are inside the shadow contour. And once we find those, we take the average position of them. So we, you know, what are the X and Y pixels where those bright spots appear inside the shadow? And then um, the average of those four spots is, you know, the center of our image. Uh, so, sorry, it's the center of our targeting array. And we try then to move the uh, roll and tilt motors so that that targeting array centers in our image. It actually goes towards something called X target and Y target, which we set at the very top. It's one of the things that you can customize. I mentioned that you don't have to worry about where your camera's pointed exactly. This is the piece of code, the X target and Y target, um, where you can decide where what is the center of your image and where should you try to get your targeting array to sit. So you'll actually have to adjust that in just a little bit. Um, but that's what this whole function does, is it tries to get those target bright spots in the middle of our image. And then we know um, that we're perfectly oriented towards the sun. Uh, keep working up here. Here we draw some text, uh, just adds text to an image. Um, here we draw an image. That's something that we can uh, put put text and contours onto an image. So draw on the image some more. Um, here we're, we're moving an actuator. So this is just, you know, vanilla code that moves a linear actuator in or out. And then as we go up a little higher, this is an interesting one. This is the sun tracker. Uh, we talked about how that works earlier in the video. This is the actual code that makes it work. So it looks for um, what is one and what is zero. And this function right here, it actually puts this out into a log file so you can see the, the values of these things. This is quadrant one, quadrant two, quadrant three, quadrant four. And we are facing, so like the, we're, we're facing the front of the tracker. If, uh, if you're picturing yourself looking at your, at your um, entire frame and lens, you would be standing here. The lens would be right here, and the frame would be back here. So this is where quadrant one, two, three, and four line up, and the pin numbers that those are assigned to. And they will be uh, a value of zero if, if they're in the sun, and a value of one if they're in the shade. And so, for example, if these two are zero and these two are one, that means these two back here are shaded, and you're going to have to figure out how to get those into the sun. And the, the answer is you need to uh, tilt the lens down here, push it down. That would uh, tilt this back end here, since it's on the other side of the, uh, the, the pivot point. It would tilt that um, more towards the sun, and eventually these things would turn to zero. So that's, that's how this function works and, and what it does. Moving up just a little higher, this is our moving a servo motor function. Uh, I, I made it so that the servo motor moves smoothly. There's a little bit of a pause. It only moves a little bit at a time. You give it the total amount that you want it to adjust, but it will gradually move to that over a few tens of seconds. Otherwise, you get a big jerking action and it can cause problems for the servos. Um, so that's that's it. Those are all the functions. Everything above that is definitions and uh, adjustments that you get to make. So let's talk about those quick. You do have to customize this directory right here. 
Um, it's where everything's going to, all of the results from running this are going to sit. You do have to customize this right here. It is the model that we just created in the previous step. So you tell it which model to use. And then if you go all the way up to the top here, um, these are just a bunch of pin definitions and getting things set up. So don't worry about changing any of that. We, we want to keep that. This section right here at the very top is where you actually do need to make some adjustments. So you remember you did that motor control step where you, um, you, you figured out how to make your motors move through their full range of motion. This is where you put those values. This is the neutral value for roll. This is uh, the low range and the high range. And you can see that I, I actually added in comments to myself about you know left and right and plus and minus and that kind of stuff um, down here. So that you, you, can, you can figure out where to put those. Um, so there's three values in each of these arrays. And it's the, the neutral value, the left value, and the right value. Like how far are you allowed to move before it goes out of range? The other things that you have to adjust up here, as I mentioned, the X target and Y target. So this takes the, the width and height of the image and says, I want to get that targeting array at 35% of, of the uh, width and 50% of the height. I'm guessing you'll probably keep it at 50% of the height, but the width you can adjust. This, you actually need to run this thing a couple times and see if it's pointing toward the sun after it does its, its or fine orientation. And if it's not, then you can adjust these values and it'll try to uh, adjust the lens accordingly. And eventually you'll get a lens that's perfectly pointed up towards the sun. And then the other things that you can adjust here are right down here, these two, um, the swing scaler and the forward back scaler. If, if you notice that it's not moving all the way to uh, a weed, these are the adjustments that you can make right here. Uh, it talks about you know left and right and in and out. Um, if you're not going far enough, you need to make these values smaller. If you're going too far, you need to make these values a little bit bigger and play around with it so that it actually moves directly over the weed and then gets going. Um, here, I, I, this is a last thing which you could adjust, but I don't recommend it. I actually I struggled making these values bigger. Um, so what happens is this is the this is how many pixels you're going to get on your Raspberry Pi camera, and if you make those as big as they can be. Uh, it takes a really wide angle shot, which is cool, but your motors can't actually move that far. So you might identify a weed that's you know way out to the left or way out to the right, but you can't swing that far. Uh, keeping these values smaller actually seemed to, to, to help. It keeps it within the scope of what we can handle and what we can get to with these motors. So don't, uh, maybe in a future revision, we'll figure out how to make those motors go further and then you can really open up these values and take bigger images. But for now, leave, leave those as is. So that is the weed killer script. Now let's talk about how this thing runs quick. Um, as you see, we, we actually have a, a little helper um, function here. It, it shows us how to run this right up here. This is one of the downloads that you can grab. Um, this Python three, blah, 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 is the command that you use to run this thing. So it's running the weed killer for Dot py script and what does this do well it runs and then it takes all the output and it drops it into a log file and then this script also drops all of its photos into a log directory so let's take a look and see what you know, one of those actually looks like so that you can see what you should expect when this thing runs um, all right first off let's assume that we want to look at a log file so we just ran this thing and it dropped a log file out there this is um, a visual representation of our sun tracker. So it started out with these two things in the shade, these two things in the sun. And it said, okay, I've got to tilt away from the peak. And it kept tilting, 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 tilting. You see one of them went this way. Oh, now we, these two are in the shade. So it says, oh, I've got to roll a little bit to the, uh, to the right here. Okay, tilting, 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 tilting. And eventually, as it gets down to here, all of them are in the sun. So now we're oriented towards the sun. Then it says, okay, next step is we've got to do a fine adjust so that all this stuff down here um, is, it, it tells us what um, the that orient to sun function is doing. It's actually running the orient to sun function right here. And it's trying to center the bright spots in the image. So rather than looking at the text, let's actually go look at what the output of this looks like because it's, it's more interesting. Uh, this one right here. Okay, so it's, it's going to... Uh, start out the image start start out its search with this and uh oh it was just barely in the image it looks like so it started out here it found the outline of the shadow it found the bright spot and then it figured out how to move that point to our target point which is right here so it made some calculations on how to change that and eventually it got over to here which is a, a fully centered image take a look at it quick 
Sorry, this is a bit slow. Uh, there we go. So it finally got those four dots to center right where we want it to be. And now we know that we are truly oriented towards the sun. You see, I mentioned that the, the course adjust isn't all that great. It gets you close, but not close enough. This got us the rest of the way there. Now, um, after that, it starts taking images. So uh, if we look at some of these, it will save off what's called a search image. So these, these big ones uh, where they have search in the, in the title, right here is a full image and it's take come okay so there it is it took a full image and then it windows this and it works its way through each window and all of these little saved off images here are what it thinks might be in here and you can tell what it thinks is in here by the name of that image so um, you can it works off of that first search image, windows each of them, and it thinks that this, it's got a 4.39 score that this is dirt, and it does look pretty much like dirt. It thinks it, there might be a potato in there, but it's a pretty low score. Um, so what it does is it goes through each one of those, and it says, okay, what do I think is in one of these? Um, and only when it sees something that it thinks is a weed, so the name of that thing is a weed, and it's got a high score, will it actually attempt to go kill it. So if we jump back to our, our log output here, um, we'll get a message that says we're centered. Uh, where is it? Found reading. Okay, so right here, uh, up above, we, we found out that we were centered, and then we came down here and we're analyzing this search image first. And it says, uh, we found an image, we found a weed in the image at uh, the value, this thing at one zero and uh, sorry, one, three. So X value of one, that means it moved slightly to the right for X and then down one, two, three blocks of Y. So it thinks that there is a weed there. And what it, what it did after that is it actually ran the, um, uh, the in out motor out quite a ways and um, didn't, didn't have to do a whole lot of swing. It probably swung just a little bit to the right and then it, it blasted the weed. So um, we made it over it and Took a, took a shot at that weed and hopefully zapped it completely. So that's what, you know, you can read the output of this and you can go through these images here and you can actually see in real time what your weeder was trying to do, what it thought each of these little windows had inside of it and, um, you know, how to deal with that. So uh, that's how this whole thing works. When you feel comfortable in this, you can actually put it in a cron tab and make it reboot, uh, run on reboot, and you'll be able to, uh, you know, Watch this thing head off and take care of weeds on your behalf. So uh, a couple comments. Um, I think this thing could be improved. Let's go discuss how it could be improved in our last section. There are five main things that if you want to build this, you should think about changing before you build it. First off, this frame is really big. You can see I built it so that it would straddle the rows in my garden. I've got grass on either side. But this is big, this is heavy, and it really isn't ideal. Having run it for a while, I think a small frame sitting on the ground with a stalk coming up and then the lens popping off of it is a better uh, option. Second, these wheels back here are just what I had laying around. Uh, I actually don't recommend that you build this. I mean, it works. They're bike tires. That's a little tiny motor running them. But something that's chain driven or better yet, if you go with a small frame on the ground, maybe 3D printed tank, tank treads or something like that, that's going to be much more reliable. These wheels uh, often get bogged down or slip. Third, this arm right here is rather heavy. I mean, these linear actuators are heavy, and I built them that way because I wanted this to straddle the rows. I wanted it to be able to look over my plants in the row and still kill weeds, and it does, but it's just not worth it. I think that you could use way lighter components and probably 3D print some things uh, so that you get plastic components, and this whole thing could be shrunk down to, uh, you know, a pound or something like that, something very, very lightweight. So probably 3D printing this whole robotic arm is a, is a great idea. Last, there are two things that are sort of inside the Raspberry Pi code that need to be updated. Uh, first off, the model that's being used as image classification here uh, is specific to my garden and it's going to be specific to your garden. If you plan to make this into something that's more widely used, you're going to want a lot more plants and weeds and a lot more images to train on so that you get more consistent results in different environments. And second, right now this thing identifies a weed, it moves to it, and then it just paints a whole 3x3x3 three 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 cube with burning sunlight. That's not ideal. What would actually be a better idea is if you were to move this 
right over the weed and then check that you are centered on the weed. Maybe even have some code that can find the center of a weed. And then, um, you know, check to make sure that everything is lined up and that you're not potentially going to hit one of these other uh, plants, these are, these are little bean plants here, uh, with light. Because if you have a, a weed next to a crop, you could accidentally burn your crop and, uh, you know, ruin that. Right now, there's nothing to prevent that. It just paints the whole weeded area and uh, hopes for the best. So certainly getting this to center over a weed, you know, checking specific pixels, making sure that it's just fine adjusted before you open up that lens is going to be a good idea. That's it. I hope you enjoyed the build and get out there and burn some weeds. Let me know what you think in the comments and don't forget to like and subscribe for more unique and useful do-it-yourself builds.